webinar for the Clean Marinas program and the Great Lakes Clean Marina Network. Uh, my name is Sarah Orlando, and we're going to get started here shortly with some of our presenters. Um, I want to first thank you all for uh, being a participant in this webinar, and for those of you who may listen to this uh, webinar recording in the future, uh, we appreciate your interest in uh, environmentally friendly landscaping and other ways to improve uh, your reputation as a clean marina, wherever you are in the Great Lakes. Uh, the presentation is going to start shortly. Uh, if at any time you have problems with your audio or issues with WebEx, uh, please email Christina Deerkes at D-I-E-R-K-E-S dot 10 at OSU dot edu, or you're also welcome to use the, the chat box. Um, I'm going to have Christina go over housekeeping real quickly with some information, and then we'll get started. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody. Just a couple of quick things. Um, like Sarah said, we are recording the webinar, and I'll post the link to our YouTube channel where that video will be available in a couple of days um, in the chat box later on. Um, you also see at the bottom of the screen there a post-webinar survey. Um, if you wouldn't mind filling that out after the webinar, it helps us um, tailor future events to your interest and see what else you might be interested in. Um, Sarah and the presenters will go through all of their presentations first. Um, we're holding questions at the end for at the end. Um, you can ask those questions via the chat feature, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen, kind of in the center there. If you're not seeing that, at the top right of your screen, there should be a gray speech bubble that says chat. If you click on that, that'll turn blue and pop up the chat box um, in that right sidebar there. Um, Sarah and I will both be monitoring that, so just feel free to send questions whenever they come up and we'll collect them and um, post them to the presenters at the end. Um, if you have any technical problems, like Sarah said, you can email me. My email is in that chat feature or just use that chat box to ask questions and I'll get back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Christina. So before we get started, I just want to mention uh, the Great Lakes Clean Marina Network. A lot of you are probably on this call as a result of being involved with that network. Um, for those marina operators and owners who are not aware of the network, it's basically a partnership between industry, university, nonprofit, and uh, government agencies. And it's meant to bring together uh, clean marina programs across the Great Lakes. You can find information about that network at glcleanmarina.org. And there's a wealth of resources, brochures, past webinars, all sorts of information on that website. This webinar recording will be posted um, on the Great Lakes Clean Marina Network under resources um, when we get that YouTube video available. And there's other ones such as invasive species, storm water, um, boat bottom washing that are all hopefully helpful resources for you. So with that, we're going to get started with our first speaker. Adam Mulliver is a native of Amherst, Ohio. He's uh, served four years active duty in the Marine Corps, attended Hawking College School of Natural Resources, and uh, currently resides in Garrettsville, Ohio. He uh, manages Northeast Ohio's Preserve Districts, and he's a member of the ODNR Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. So we appreciate him being here today. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah, and hello to everybody in the room again, and those online. Um, hopefully you can hear me clearly and see all the slides. If not, I'm sure I'll hear about it, and we will fix things. So the first slide, you can obviously see what we're going to talk about, invasive species and uh, alternatives, uh, predominantly by going native and planting native plant species. So I wanted to start out by showing you a series of pictures here of marinas. And there's two things that I want to point out about, about these, these four pictures here. One is what they have in common, and one, uh, one thing, which is what they don't, don't have in common, is obviously a different type of marina for each picture here. You have very, um, I would say, rural type of marinas, very industrial, and kind of a mix of both. And so when I was asked to put uh, this presentation together before I knew the different kinds of marinas that were out there, I was a little distraught because I don't know how to present invasive species to marina owners. So Jenny Rohr, whom some of you know, or hopefully will soon know, um, with the Clean Marinas program, was kind enough to take me around 
and look at some of these marinas up along Lake Erie, and as you can see, um, I soon discovered there is a huge variety of marinas, which was very informational, and I did learn a lot, but then I, it was even more confusing. I said, wow, there is really no silver bullet for this. So um, I don't want to go too deep in the weeds, and that pun is totally intended, and because I'm the most unwitty person there is, and it's like the only pun I could come up with. I don't want to go too deep in the weeds with the, with the topic today. I want to be very generalistic about the whole thing um, and open your eyes to invasives and, and just one of the alternative methods you might implement. Now, the thing that these marinas have, which is the same, is that they are doorways. They are portals, if you will. And at your house, if you don't want somebody to come in your home, you keep the door shut, unless it's a nosy neighbor that likes to do the pop-in every now and then. Um, and if that's the case, you lock it. In a situation like this with marinas, these, these doors, you can't, you can't really close them. You can't really lock them. Uh, invasive species are able to cross that threshold um, in and out very easily, and they do very well on either side of that threshold. So that's why after we did our tour, I realized, wow, marinas are a really important uh, place to kind of key in on when we talk about invasive species. And so you're going to learn something, hopefully today. Um, I want you to come away with something. I'm going to try to move as fast as possible, but not at the expense of learning something because we are, you know, kind of crunched on time with all the speakers today. But I want you to learn at least what an invasive species is. You know, why is it a problem? What, what's the big deal about all this? And, and how to identify a few of them. Um, if you don't know what's out there, then you really don't know why it's a problem, and you don't know if it's a problem. You might think something like purple loose stripe is really, really pretty. Uh, but I'm going to explain to you why it, it may be pretty, but it's not good for the environment. Uh, I want you to obtain some information on some alternative methods um, and costs to transition from maybe um, an area that you continually mow or some of your uh, beds or planters that you already have plants in to native plants. And what's the benefit to you and your customers by going native? So what is, what is an invasive plant? Well, here's your textbook uh, definition. Invasive species, I'm talking about plant species mainly today. These are exotic, non-native species that are likely to cause the following, economic, environmental, harm or harm to human health. Um, not every non-native plant is necessarily invasive. Uh, there's some exceptions to those. I've listed a few of them. Uh, coltsfoot, which is pictured here. Um, coltsfoot, which, uh, a little trivia for you, um, one of our, some of our earlier cough medicines like Robitussin were derived from some of the chemical compounds found in coltsfoot, but that's become somewhat naturalized and it's actually considered a, a springtime ephemeral wildflower, even though it's not native. So we're, we're going to focus in the stuff on the stuff that is really problematic. Um, economic harm. So I, what I wanted to do is show you a really quick and fun video, and I wish Ohio had something like this, but I had to go all the way to Texas to give you an idea of some of the economic and environmental impacts that uh, in, invasive species can, can cause. Are you looking for this? Whoa. Invasive plants like giant We are coming back to the presentation. Yeah. A little bit of technical difficulty here. We're going to get through it. Okay, and I think we're back. And so, as always, there's a problem with technology, but I, I had to show that because it drives the point home. Uh, there is an economic impact, okay? to or from invasive species. And not just fisheries. Um, fisheries is a big one, obviously uh, related to you marina owners, because people are coming to your marinas, a large part of them, to fish. And if habitat loss happens, that can directly impact your, your, fish, your fisheries, and it will affect your, um, your business as well. Uh, but all sorts of different you know, outdoor activities are affected by this. And, 
Um, just some, some quick facts. So Ohio is, is ninth in the nation for the number of registered votes. Uh, one in four people are likely to go voting throughout the year. And it's $11.5 billion industry relating to boats. So there's a huge economic impact when invasive species uh, are entered into this, this arena. And it could be things like recreational boating that are impacted, water skiing, tubing, when you talk about things like um, hydrilla, which I'll, I'll go over later, things that really clog or impede waterways. And they're also unsightly. Um, there's an aesthetic uh, value that's lost when we let invasive species come in and around our marinas. You might have beaches associated with your marinas. People like to go to and lay out and, and view the wildlife or maybe a picnic area that's around nearby and it, it's nice and serene. Well, when that area becomes infested with invasives, they're less likely to come to that area and frequent your business. Um, there's a huge impact economically. And just really quickly, I'm going to come back to the mowing aspect, that uh, second to last bullet on the slide. Um, but I just want to mention, we, we spend somewhere around $30 billion a year mowing grass. Now, I know grass is not really so much an invasive species. It's kind of our landscape around our homes and our businesses. But I want to come back to that and see how we might be able to reduce some of that cost. But one of the big things on this slide is that costs are somewhere around $138 billion each year, and that's the economic impact with plant and animal uh, invasive species combined. So there's a huge economic cost if we let these things go unchecked. Uh, this is probably the one that I deal with the most, and that's how invasive species um, infect the environment. But again, the environment is directly related to your business as marina owners. Um, things like displa displacement of uh, nesting forage habitat for birds, especially birds that we associate more with uh, wetland or wet areas like the Virginia rail or the marsh wren. Uh, these, these animals need specific habitat requirements that are well balanced. Um, habitats that have taken thousands and thousands of years to balance out specifically for them. Um, so when you, when you look at when invasive species are introduced into a system, they tend to form monocultures. They tend to take over habitat really, really quickly. We call that exponential growth without going into all the, all the uh, graphs and so on. Exponential growth is when you have, you know, an introduction of a species and it's, it's kind of steady for a while and all of a sudden it shoots straight up and it keeps going up like a rocket compared to log logistic growth, which is what we normally see in the environment where a species tends to, to start out and then it goes up and then it hits carrying capacity because it's fitting into its niche and it kind of or hopefully should stay there and it levels and plateaus off. And bases don't do that. Um, they can lie dormant or they can lie relatively low for a while and then explode and before you know it you have a really, really big problem on your hands. Uh, these cause things, these cause problems uh, for pollinators, bees, honeybees, bumblebees, butterflies. It can lead to extirpation. Uh, which is a regional loss of a plant or animal, or in some instances, extinction. I don't know of an invasive species that we've been able to extirpate, but I know of plenty of native things that have been extirpated. Um, so there's a lot of really bad things that can happen environmentally. One to pay attention to, again, is um, waterways. And when invasives become introduced into waterways, we can see things like decrease in dissolved oxygen, which, again, leads to fish kill, which leads to fewer people coming to your, to your marina to get on their boat to get out to the lake or the river and to do their, their fishing. Um, this, it's a domino effect, and that's what that last paragraph talks about. An invasive species uh, introduction is almost like a domino effect once it's introduced, and it spreads out to all sorts of different um, ecological services and causes harm. Okay, Let's talk about human harm for a second. Human, we don't typically think of the human harm aspect of plants, but things like Tree of Heaven, which uh, have known to cause uh, myocarditis, that's the inflammation of the, the inner muscles of your heart. Um, when, when people come into contact, sometimes with the sap in Tree of Heaven, that can occur. Uh, giant hogweed, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. That can uh, cause these skin irritations, phytophotodermatitis, try saying that five times fast. Uh, very severe and painful reactions. Fire risks. I've got a picture in a little while of how Phragmites can be a significant risk of fire. Uh, if you're a marina owner and you have a lot of Phragmites in and around your marina, if it hasn't caught fire yet, 
it likely will at some time. And um, that can cause a lot of damage, not just to your property, but potentially a lot of other people's property as well. A decreased visibility on roadways, leading to motor vehicle accidents, and so on, and unknown health problems. There, there are a lot of things that um, invasive species do that cause harm on, on all three of those, those issues. So how do they get here? Waterways, shipping containers, uh, especially nautical shipping containers, ornamental plants that are brought in for gardening. Uh, we use some of these, we thought they'd be great for erosion control, so we planted them all along our ditches and highways. Uh, here, one that I underline, because I think it applies to, to marine owners, is the unwashed boats and, and trailers, something that if you're in the Clean Marinas program, you've probably already heard a lot about. And uh, I just congratulate those that have done that. It's, it's an awesome step forward. Uh, wood transportation in, in various forms, forage crops. Unfortunately, uh, in the past, even our, our DNRs and our conservation groups want, uh, uh, supported the planting of things like bush honeysuckles and autumn olives for, for cover crops and, and reclamation sites, and now we're dealing with the problems later on. Uh, a lot of issues, a lot of ways that they, they got here. In Ohio, there's approximately Oh, 20, 20, 22 percent of the total plant population is invasive uh, in Ohio right now, and that number is only going up, folks. It only goes up. Like I said, I've never seen an invasive that we've totally eradicated or extirpated from the state. Here's what we're going to go through kind of quickly. I'm going to show you a half a dozen or so of the most common invasives that you're probably going to find around your marina. Actually, anywhere. That's why they're so common. That's why they're invasive. They grow anywhere. Um, some of them look pretty, again, but um, I'll go over some of the specifics on why they're bad. The first is our bush honeysuckle group. There's, there's typically three of the honeysuckles uh, that we find around in Ohio that are invasive. They all have very similar characteristics, um, but they're very, they're very invasive. They create poor, poor birding habitat um, for nesting and foraging. Uh, alleliopathic, if you hear me say that word, it just means that they inhibit other plants from growing around them, which is a bad thing. They're harmful to macroinvertebrates, uh, especially around waterways. So if you have the, a marina with streams or creeks, um, they, the leaves on the bush honeysuckles create very poor leaf packs, and those leaf packs and your streams and your creeks are essential for macroinvertebrates to survive and, in a sense, contribute to the rest of the, of the food web. And so if you don't have that initial building block uh, for the food web, lots of other bad things can happen uh, with animal species. They all produce these little red berries, um, which look really yummy and delicious because they're red, uh, but everybody loves red candy. Anything red is the favorite, right? But it's really no better than Mountain Dew to us. So it's the comparison is, is water and Mountain Dew for us, and it's not beneficial unless you're a dentist, and then Mountain Dew is a good thing. But it's really bad for birds. Same with autumn olive. You can see uh, both the autumn olive and Russian olive have that kind of silvery, speckly appearance on the leaves, and they produce these little olive-like fruits. Um, these, are, again, are shrubs. They're fast-growing, very nutrient-poor, and they just displace. They displace vegetation. Um, Typically, you might have one or two species of invasive shrubs growing together. Typically, it's usually one. That's a monoculture that we talk about, that lack of diversity, one type of plant. Uh, glossy buckhorn. This one right here, folks, is probably one you're going to encounter the most around marinas or wet areas. Glossy buckthorn, uh, it was brought in as an ornamental uh, from Europe, um, and it's, it does well in pretty much any kind of habitat, whether it's dry or wet, it's very non-selective. It outcompetes quickly, and the birds contribute to this spread because they do eat the seeds again, which are, are poor nutrients, but as they, as they fly away and defecate and they spread the seed, it goes on and on and on. Again, so common reed grass. Here's the fire patch that I spoke about. This, this is uh, an aerial photo of Menor Marsh State Nature Preserve in Lake County. Uh, and I believe this is from 2003. Uh, the marsh, which um, is approximately, oh, it's about 660 acre uh, marsh, 
is more or less completely a monoculture of Phragmites except for a few places. Um, there's some great work going on right now to eradicate the Phragmites, but uh, you can see as the thatch dries, it becomes very, very likely to catch fire. Look at the buildings that are close to the marsh. Uh, if you're a homeowner, I would be scared. I would not want Phragmites around. If I was a boat owner, I would probably not want Phragmites in or around my boat. This stuff burns hot and it burns fast. Um, this, is a, this is a wetland invader. This is one that you're going to find typically around your marinas, streams, just about anywhere. Um, it also displaces migratory bird habitat. Um, so again, nothing good about any of this stuff. Now here's one you're probably saying, oh, cattail's good. I mean, if I see cattail in a wetland, that's good, right? Cattails are native. Yeah, yes and no. Na narrow leaf cattail is hybridized with uh, our, our, what we consider to be native cattail to create a hybrid cattail. But to be honest with you, we're not even sure if cattail, the um, broadleaf cattail, is native to Ohio. Uh, there's no mention of it pre-settlement, European settlement by Native Americans. There's no real early records of it by early botanists or explorers. Cattail, in a sense, possibly both species are invasive, but definitely narrow leaf uh, cattail. This is one you're going to want to watch out for. Here's the big takeaway. 200 plus thousand seeds per flowering head of cattail. So you may look out your, your window of your marina office and say, oh, I've got a couple cattails there, no big deal. They're packed with seeds and they spread very, very quickly. Japanese knotweed is one I, I guarantee that some of you marina owners along the rivers have seen already. If not, you will. Um, this one right here is just, it, it's, it's very, very bad invasive because it spreads very quickly and the um, seeds are carried downstream uh, as they continue to grow. It's a very poor, um, it's very poor for erosion control. So when it displaces the native plants that are normally holding the, the soil uh, in place along streams, uh, it doesn't do a very good job of that. So it increases sedimentation and uh, we all know how much of a problem it can be to dredge our channels, uh, you know, yearly or, or biannually from all the sediments. So having native plants upstream rather than invasive plants uh, cuts back on a lot of that sedimentation. There's no wildlife value to it really at all either. This one right here, this is uh, probably the uh, number one that we've talked about the most is purple loosestrife. Um, purple loosestrife, again, this is an ornamental that was brought in. <laughs> Excuse me. And purple loosestrife spreads extremely quickly and it displaces native vegetation unbelievably quick. It's not suitable for wetland birds like the marsh wren, the Virginia rail, the sora. It, it's extremely pretty with that purple color, um, but it, it, it really alters the wetland. It, it increases nutrient loading. There's just a host of things that are really bad about it. Um, Purple loose strife. And the last one that I'm going to show you is hydrilla. Uh, this one I wanted to really show you guys because hydrilla is relatively new to Ohio. Um, however, it's not new to the United States. It was first discovered in Florida in the 1950s. It was an aquarium plant that, was, that escaped. Uh, by the 1990s, it occupied over 140,000 acres of freshwater lakes in Florida. Uh, really, really nasty stuff because what happens is it's a submerged, a submergent type of vegetation. It starts at the bottom of a lake or a stream. It roots, it grows up, this kind of column uh, of plant material eventually reaching the surface and it forms a dense, thick mass of vegetation, which is the first slide I showed you, my title slide, you saw the boat, mat, boat motor, excuse me, that was wrapped up with plants, that was hydrilla. Um, it, is, it is very detrimental to boat motors, canoeing, paddle boarding. Um, it doesn't matter. If you do something on the water and you have hydrilla in or around your, your lake or stream, you're going to have problems. Um, look at the 90% efficiency. It, it, it impedes range by 90% of efficiency. Uh, again, the dissolved oxygen, reducing dissolved oxygen kills fish. This is one that we don't want to see, and I will tell you that uh, currently there is a group of uh, conservationists, many of them from Cleveland Metro Parks, which are um, working on getting some grant funding to start a hydrilla 
uh, program of identification, mapping, and eventually management techniques. So um, we, are, we are doing something about it. So what do we do? What do we do with all this invasive stuff? Now that I've, I've shown you what kind of what's out there, what can you do as marine owners? Do you even want to do anything? Um, you may think what you have is already pretty. Maybe the stuff that you plan around your office that you went to, you know, Petites or wherever to buy is really pretty, and it probably is. But, again, um, there are native alternatives out there, just as beautiful and much, much better for our, our environment. So I wanted to focus on one aspect of a solution to invasives. I didn't want to go into other types of management techniques because that's, that's a whole other story. So if you, if you were to look at this, this picture up here, you probably know a little bit now about the, the red colored portion where we have the invasive plants, but you probably aren't too familiar with the green side. And it talks a lot about invasives. Let's see some of these native plants. Um, are native plants even pretty? Yes, they're, they're gorgeous, okay? And as you can see, there's a host of variety of different kinds of native plants out there. This collage isn't meant to be, okay, I need to go get, get the winter berry, I need to go get the flock. This is just to show you the color, the variety, the diversity of, of native plants, plants that are available for you um, to purchase and to implement in and around your property. So I want to start off with a few, a few alternatives. Again, these aren't, these, aren't suggest these are just suggestions. These aren't specific plants that I'm telling you you should plant. These are considerations. I tried to select things that would probably grow well around some of the marinas that I saw, which were mostly up by Lake Erie, uh, where you have some sandy soils and, and, and larger open areas, especially in northwest Ohio. Um, this is a, these are not so much trees as they are really big shrubs, but um, I didn't want to promote you know you planting really big trees in and around your buildings and stuff because that can become problematic. So here's some you know me medium sized trees or large shrubs. Wafer ash does really well in sandy areas. Sweet gum has a beautiful fall foliage with the multiple colors. And the box elder uh, is one that does really well in wet areas or riparian corridors, areas that, around your marina. Here are some shrub shrubs, okay? Uh, all just diverse. Look at the color in these. Button bush is great for wetland or wet areas. This does really well in, in wet areas. Uh, winterberry holly as well. The nice thing about winterberry is those red berries that you see on there, they persist through the winter. So you lose some foliage, but you can still have some color throughout the year. Um, and those, in order to get those, you would need a, a male and female plant. Uh, false indigo is another type of shrub with a, with a really pretty purple flower to it. It attracts a lot of pollinators. Um, it's, it's an excellent shrub to consider. I want to show you some flowers. I only wanted to show you a couple annual flower alternatives because most of us want perennials. We want something that's going to come back. We're sure we, we're sure it will come back every year. We hope it will come back every year. Uh, but a few of the annual um, alternatives that grow up and around Lake Erie and then the, the more open ranges, uh, partridge pea and sea rocket. And again, annuals are, are flowers that uh, reproduce by seed every year. Uh, your perennials, they also produce seed, but the root system will reproduce a new stem and a new flowering structure uh, year after year. So here are some perennials. Again, look at the color here. Primrose, spiderwort, bee balm, all attract pollinators, all different colors. Um, you know, putting these things together and, and clumping them together in your beds or around your buildings, you're really going to make it more attractive to your visitors and, and uh, your, your clients. Okay, so just a few more perennials. I won't, we have to keep moving, so I'm going to just kind of let you guys review this once you get the, the webinar. But again, lots of variety out there. Grasses are also important. Switchgrass, blue stem, American beach grass if you're up on Lake Erie. Lots of color, not your typical grass. These have, you know, they grow up nice and straight. You know, morphologically, they look nice. They don't look like a bunch of clumped weeds. You can do it because we did it. A few, a few uh, quotes I want to let you read really quickly. I'll read one of them for time. A smooth, closely shaven surface of grass is by far the most essential element of beauty on the grounds of a suburban home. This was Frank J. Scott, or F.J. Scott. He, uh, he and Frederick uh, Olmsted were considered the fathers of the modern lawn. 
that's why we have grass, that's why we mow grass once or twice a week and our neighbors glare at us if we don't because it's our civic duty to mow. Here's what can happen though. This is our central office in, in Columbus. If, uh, the focal point in the last slide was the grass and some utility boxes. Well, once we planted some seed after prepping the site, we have some beautiful uh, forbs and grasses. You can do this at home as well or around your marina building. Um, Rob Curtis, he's a, a Summit County Metro Parks uh, employee and as you can see after some prep work, um, very quickly he converted the front of his house uh, into a, a beautiful landscape of uh, wildflowers. Uh, another D uh, Division of Wildlife employee on a much smaller scale for those of you that had the more urban style marinas, you might just do a, a bed. You can do it. It's very easy. Um, the cost, it depends on what you want to do. You can test out. I, I, chose, Nate, I chose prairie seeds or, or converting a mode area to um, native species because that's one of the easiest things I can explain to you. $15.95, depending on where you go, um, you can get a small seed packet to do a test plot. You're going to save about a third of what it would cost you to mow your lawn or mow that area if you were to transition it to uh, prairie species. Shop around, prices are competitive, there are native plant nurseries out there, and the cost is more or less the same as you would find at Lowe's. Uh, you, should, you should do this or you should want to consider doing this so you can be on the leading edge of um, leading the fight against invasives, reducing your costs, supporting local businesses, increasing the attractiveness of your marina and wildlife habitat. Here we have uh, just a really quick, if you go to leapbio.org and uh, right down this website, you'll find an interactive website uh, that has an, inter I'm sorry, an interactive map of native plant nurseries throughout Ohio, Pennsylvania, and beyond. Click on each, each one, it'll link you to their website, as well as a downloadable uh, Excel file with all of the different uh, percentages of stock that is native or non-native, uh, the certification of the plant, all sorts of things. It's already been done for you. It's very, very easy, very user-friendly. Some resources. The main one I want to point out here, since we're, we're about done with time, is all the way at the bottom. Those of you that are thinking, I want to do this, but I don't know how. I don't have any money. I need help. The CWMA's Cooperative Weed Management Agreement or Association. These are, these are consortiums of conservation groups, typically Metro Parks, ODNR, TNC, the Nature Conservancy, that are there to not only help each other on their properties with invasive plant species, but also to reach out to private landowners to give you their technical advice or to perform work or to help you just figure out what you can do to um, get going and make a difference. There's also a lot of other programs through Ducks Unlimited and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that are actually funding sources, grants available to um, promote pollinator habitat and native plant species. A lot of stuff out there. You can always contact me if you have any questions. I want to acknowledge everybody who uh, played a part in this and putting the presentation together and thank you again um, to Sarah for having me as a guest today, and I, if we have any questions later, I'll be glad to answer them. That was perfect, Adam. Um, next up we have Mel Hauser. presentation up here. Mel is with the Good Nature Organic Lawn Care Company. He is a community representative. Um, he's been a lifetime resident of Northeast Ohio, currently residing in Brook Park. He's been serving on the Rocky River Watershed Council Board since 2011. And in both his personal and vocational endeavors, he strives to protect our natural environment for his children, grandchildren, and for, and for future generations. I was really glad to have Mel here. He's going to talk a little bit about um, organic lawn care for us. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Ohio Sea Grant and the uh, Clean Marinas Program for this opportunity, um, and to our audience and you folks out on the, uh, the internet. Uh, today, I'll be talking to you about uh, you and your clean marina. Uh, be nice to our environment. Your livelihood and your future depends on it. 
I'm probably preaching to the choir and don't need to tell you how important a vital and healthy natural environment, whether it's our water, air, or land, it's very important for the success of your business. Um, simply due to the proximity you are to our lakes, rivers, and streams, uh, what you do to maintain your property and landscaping has a tremendous ecological and environmental footprint. So today, three parts of tonight's overview. That will help. Uh, what does organic really mean? Organic is a somewhat newer term, I think, in the last decade or two, and everybody throws it around out there. Why does organic lawn care make sense? And how to think and be organic. Uh, hopefully some of you are already operating uh, certified clean marinas. Perhaps some of you are currently using a lawn care or landscape service. Some of you might be applying lawn and garden products yourselves, or some of you might be taking the natural approach and doing absolutely nothing. Um, a, our company, and in my opinion, a true and sincere organic lawn care company is not one that's out there trying to proliferate the expansion of lawns. We are around and we want to be organic so that if you care about having a lawn and you want to do something, you'll go organic and not go chemical. So, so let's start. What is organic? Um, you'll see the two uh, definitions up there. I looked in uh, Webster's Dictionary, and oh my goodness, it was half a page. We could be up here for 10 minutes just reading that. Uh, one of the fuller definitions of organic is food that's produced with the use of feed or fertilizer of plant or animal origin without employment of chemically formulated fertilizers, growth stimulants, antibiotics, or pesticides, or of relating to or containing carbon compounds. Now, containing carbon compounds, if you're a chemistry student or my generation, which luckily a lot of you don't know, uh, carbon means uh, a lot of different things. Uh, gasoline is basically carbon. So in other words, uh, carbon is organic, therefore we could use gasoline on our lawn or out in uh, applications like that. Uh, However, that's obviously not the case. So for today, let's stick to some more practical definitions. Employing non-chemical solutions for your lawn and garden needs. Products that are typically less risky to people, pets, and wildlife. Some more, a little bit more on what is organic. Organic products are derived from sources, some of which are food grade, not containing synthetically formulated chemicals. The key word there is synthetically. Uh, there are natural chemical compounds that are used in organics, in organic lawn care and garden care, but they're in their natural state and they're working the way nature intended them to. Uh, the list on the bottom, these are all plant or animal-based ingredients, some of them obviously very familiar to you probably. Corn, molasses, go down the list. There's a couple at the bottom I'll be explaining a little bit later. Uh, maybe you have or have not heard of them. Diatomaceous earth and beneficial nematodes. Moving on to why are organics better? It's better for the environment uh, of 30. Most commonly used lawn pesticides, 24, toxic to fish, that hits right home, doesn't it? Uh, and aquatic organisms, 16 are toxic to birds and 11 are deadly to bees. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of those products are the most commonly and usually and aggressively advertised and marketed by the multi-billion dollar lawn care industry. Uh, of which most of that lawn care industry is chemical. So that's why we're here today to hopefully help educate 
engage you and maybe get you excited that there are other alternatives to take care of your lawn and trees and shrubs than throwing out unnecessary chemicals. Um, I, in uh, Adam's presentation, he made a couple references to, uh, I think, an architect that said a, a well-clipped lawn or something to that extent. Well, I, I read a very interesting book uh, about America's obsession with a green lawn, and it all started back in the 1950s. And um, it really is um, a re <laughs> why we want green grass and a well-mowed carpet of turf I don't know for sure, uh, but it's there. So again, we're trying to do our part. Uh, working with a small mouse here, forgive me folks. Um, it's better for our, our environment. Also, synthetic fertilizers, those manufactured by um, larger companies, one starts with M, the other starts with B, I'm not going to mention any names, but um, they are water soluble and they very easily enter into our local watershed and eventually end up in our lakes, rivers, and streams. And it's, you know, this type of phosphate runoff that's helped create the dead zones and the alga balloons in Lake Erie and other lakes around Northeast Ohio and the Great Lakes. And we can't just blame big ag and the farmers. Uh, homeowners, residential and, and smaller property owners, which I'm going to classify, I think today, marinas, you're you know, more of a scale of a residential or a small business than a farmer. But homeowners use 10 times the amount of chemical fertilizers as the farming industry. You think about that for a minute. That's, that's <laughs> you know, you look at your own lawn or your own marina and so, me and all the other people putting down, we're using more fertilizer, more chemical fertilizer than big ag, the farmers that grow our food. Um, and it's not just the use of these chemicals, it's the misuse and the disposal. So misuse, by that I mean uh, I go to the, to the store, I buy a product and it tells me to mix a certain amount and being the macho guy I am, I'm going to really kill those weeds, so I'm going to put in some more. And <laughs> they'll never come back now. Well, that's not the case. That's not the way the natural cycle of, of weeds works. And so now you've just even contributed more directly to that runoff problem, to those pesticides, those harmful chemicals going right down the, uh, the sewer after the next big rainstorm or a thunderstorm. I was, uh, I'll just let you soak in that picture for a minute while I explain. Just the other day I was uh, sitting at a coffee shop in the morning, uh, actually almost on the previous slide and the thunderstorm started. I'm sitting there going, hmm, if somebody had just put down pesticides or put down a chemical and this rain came, half of it would be washing right down the, st the storm drain right now into the closest river, stream, or lake. So why organic? Uh, it's better for our children. And this is where I might mention I, your role as also a homeowner and an employee of your staff and uh, uh, somebody in the public who when client and customers visit your marina and they see that you're being organic could have some effect on them. Um, so it isn't just uh, they hear about your marina, but it's about being organic in your home and your community. The Audubon Society tells us that there's been, uh, that close to 7 million birds are killed each year due to the aesthetic use of pesticides by homeowners. Aesthetic use means I get up in the morning and I look outside and I see a dandelion. I run to my garage and get my uh, Roundup and I go out and I spray it. Um, if you have a true problem with the weeds or with pet or with pests, that's different. But the aesthetic use is the, the word there that's really, uh, really kind of damning to me. Uh, this picture you're looking at, um, it's a picture I took. I was out on a bike ride in my own neighborhood. 
I happened to see one of the uh, little signs that says Warn warning chemical application that lawn service companies like ourselves, except that we don't put down chemicals, are required to post after they put down chemicals. Um, so I stopped and took a picture, figuring maybe down the road I could use that someplace. And I then looked on the sidewalk and in the street and saw all kinds of over application, granules of fertilizer just laying all over the place. So I took a picture of that. And I looked further down, I saw something laying in the street two houses down and here's this bird. Now, do I know for a fact that those chemicals, that fertilizer killed that bird? No, I don't, but um, I'll let you decide if you think it killed the bird. Why organic? Safer for our water supply. It all comes around what we put down the drain, what we put on our lawns, goes through our watershed system, and these environmental toxins accumulate in our bodies over time just because of the sheer volume of water that we drink and what we use for cooking and everything like that. I think I previously mentioned it. When water runs off of a lawn, the chemical pesticides and fertilizers, they become a large source of what's called non-point pollution, which is a big problem also. Come on, clicker. And as business owners, um, I think you'll appreciate this. Although organic lawn care is more expensive initially, and that's basically because of the cost of supplies. Uh, organic fertilizers and organic solutions are not mass produced by big companies. Therefore, they don't have the volume to be as competitive as someday we hope they are. Um, However, since over time you're improving the soil, your lawn's going to become healthier, you'll be able to back off the number of treatments you need, and you'll probably spend less time and effort, too. Uh, I'll mention a little bit later, too, your lawn will be able to better resist the drought, insects, and other problems. So this slide, um, as a businessman, I think you'll appreciate, because these are some freebies. These to save you money. These things here won't cost you a dime. If you don't do anything else as far as feeding or amending the soil, these tips that you're looking at will help improve your lawn. Um, and actually, the Clean Marina Best Management Practices Guidebook has a number of these. And I actually, I'll mention to Sarah out loud, saw a couple that I learned today myself. So that's cool. Um, follow the one-third rule. Uh, that's basically just saying uh, if don't ever cut off more than one-third of the grass blade at any one time. If you're gone for a couple weeks and you come back and it's up to your knees, don't cut it down to your ankles right away. <laughs> cut it halfway or cut, you know, no more than a third. Go back in a couple days and cut it more. If you cut more than a third off, it's a tremendous shock to the grass blade and you're going to put it into, uh, it, it, it's not going to like, it'll be more susceptible to disease and insects. Uh, throughout the year, it's best to have your, the height of your lawn between two and a half and four inches. At this time of year, you can start dropping the, the height down in the middle of the summer if you can let your grass grow to four inches. It's going to be very beneficial. Um, the taller your grass, blade is, the deeper your roots will go. And um, <clears throat> bag, don't bag. Don't bag mulch your clippings. Um, I cringe when I see somebody bagging their, their grass clippings. It's free, natural fertilizer that can be returned to the soil, and we're sending it to a landfill. Um, university uh, did a study, I think it might have been OSU, uh, that said that simply by mulching your clippings, your lawn will receive up to 30% of the nitrogen that it needs without 
putting anything else down here. Uh, watering. I left, you know, um, decide at the beginning of the season if you're going to water or not. The worst thing you can do is start watering and then say, uh, I'm going to stop. And then start again and then stop. So if you're going to do water, commit to it. Your lawn needs no more than one to one and a half inches of water a week. All right? So easy way to use a rain gauge, put a cat food uh, can or a tuna can out there if you have a rain and the tuna can's half filled up and the forecast doesn't call for any rain for the next three or four days, then put a hose out there, fill up the tuna can, and you're done for the week. Um, I, I also cringe, well actually I laugh when I'll, I'll go outside and I have a neighbor across the street who, what I refer to is he's washing his lawn. He'll go out every other evening, stand there with a nozzle on the hose and literally spray enough water on it to get it wet and then he turns the hose off. That's probably one of the worst possible things you can do. It just promotes mold and other insect diseases. So let's get to the, let's get to the skinny now here. Um, <clears throat> number, number one, the cultural tips. If you did nothing else, you'd be okay. If you want to fertilize, make sure that the products you use are only plant and animal based. As I showed you some of them before up on that list. Uh, naturally occurring minerals and chemicals are okay. You can't just say, oh, chemicals are bad. Many of the things that are in nature are chemical compounds. Again, the key to that word is synthetically manufactured chemicals. Be a conscious consumer, whether you're buying the product for DIY use or you're going to contract out to a lawn care service, ask the right questions. Why is this product claiming to be organic? Why is this company saying they're organic? Um, there's a lot of products out there, just like in the food industry, enhanced, fortified with vitamin C. You know, make sure you're getting the real deal. Unfortunately, there are no regulations or standards at this point on a lot of the, you know, on organic lawn care products. Um, Again, so, okay, um, chemical fertilizers are like putting your grass on steroids or drugs. Once the, the chemical's gone, uh, there's nothing there. There's nothing left in the soil. Organics, the philosophy behind it and the principles are that you're adding nutrients, organic nutrients to the soil. You're feeding the microbes. You're creating a vital soil ecosystem. The nutrients will be there when the grass feeds them not when the guy with the truck comes around and sprays it on a scheduled basis. Your lawn may not need it that day. If the nutrients are organic and they're in the soil, they'll be there when it's needed. Natural weed controls. Uh, mowing high, I mentioned that already for a different reason that it promotes root growth. Think about it. Uh, weeds, any seed needs two things to germinate, sunlight, heat, and water. If your grass blades are higher, it's going to do a couple things. It's going to block the sunlight. It's going to keep the ground below it from getting as warm as that weed seed might want. All right? Keep a thick lawn. You see a bare spot, grab a handful of seed and throw it down. Weeds are opportunistic. If you give them a chance, they'll grow. Use a natural pre-emergent um, corn. I, I apologize, I didn't put it up there. Corn gluten meal has been shown to be a very effective uh, preventative, uh, pre-emergent preventative. There are others out there. If uh, liquid iron uh, you can use on existing weeds, but whatever you do, please don't use glyphosate. Glyphosate is the main toxic ingredient in a product I'm sure you've all seen maybe have used. I will admit it that before I became an organic-minded uh, individual, I used the product called Roundup myself. Um, maybe that's not a good thing to say on a webinar, but I said it, so there we go. Um, Sorry, folks. Okay, I knew it would work now. 
natural pest controls. Um, being marina owners, uh, last thing, you know, excuse me. One of the things you don't want to see are mosquitoes and, and other insects like that. And, and uh, just as with fertilizers, uh, there are many organic and natural products that will help control that. Earlier I mentioned uh, diatomaceous earth. Uh, diatomaceous earth is a uh, crushed up fossilized, uh, fossilized diatoms that are crushed up. It's a mechanical way of preventing uh, it repels ants and other insects uh, put down on the ground or in your garage. It, it's literally like a bug walking on sandpaper or, or glass. And they'll either leave or it'll kill them. Mosquitoes, uh, one of the best uh, uh, products to repel mosquitoes is garlic juice. And we uh, use a concentrated form of garlic juice, clove oil, a lot of other natural uh, products work. As far as grubs and fleas and ticks, uh, one of the most popular grub treatments has been linked to uh, deaths of thousands of birds and a lot of bee colonies. Uh, this is when a, uh, a naturally occurring and non-toxic microorganism called beneficial nematodes. They live in the ground, they feed on the larva and uh, grub larva and insect grub. Insect grubs. So, um, I have a summary here that is too long to go over, but it will be included. It's a neat little, uh, it explains what happens when chemical fertilizers are applied, what happens when organic fertilizers are applied, and we've discussed some of them, but I think after you have had a chance to look at this in detail, you'll say, hey, that makes sense. Um, if anything doesn't make sense, hopefully I can answer questions later or online at a later date. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention, and I will now turn back over to Sarah. Thank you, Mel. All right. I just want to take a chance to quickly remind anyone on the call, if you're interested, if you have any questions for Adam, Mel, or upcoming Amy, um, please feel free to use the chat box. We'll probably have a few minutes for questions, and if not, we'll, uh, at the end, we'll uh, make sure those questions get to Adam, Mel, and Amy. So now we have Amy Riskilly <laughs> with the Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, really excited to have Amy here. Uh, she's been there for nine years and runs the district's education programs across Cuyahoga County. Uh, the majority of the presentation today and the workshops that she does focus on stormwater pollution. So some of you marina owners that have your MPDES permit, um, this is of especially importance to you. Um, she helps keep them in, uh, her stakeholders in compliance with their EPA stormwater permit. Um, so the, some of her content will be helpful for your education and your um, uh, best management practices related to that permit. Uh, Amy has an undergraduate degree from Ohio University and a master's degree from Cleveland State in Environmental Studies. She's an avid beekeeper, photographer, and also works in animal rescue. Please welcome Amy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. I really appreciate you being here. Or appreciate you having me here. Of course, you have to be here. Um, a little bit of uh, history. A lot of times when I do a presentation, I first ask people, who knows who a soil and water, what a soil and water district is? A show of hands in the room. Now, you people know. All right, that's the most I've ever had. Um, usually people aren't familiar with us, we're small agencies, um, but a quick overview, we are, um, we were formed back in 1949, uh, soil and water districts were formed out of the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, and uh, we have, we are the uh, subdivision of the state who are here in every county um, to help you out with land and aquatic resources to keep them healthy throughout the state. There should be one in every county, in every state in the country, um, some of them combine them, so in Ohio we are unique, and then we have one in each county. Um, so if you're not here in Cuyahoga County, you're in a different county, um, but particularly that you marina owners, the ones who are along the lake, utilize your soil and water district, we're here for you to help you out with things. A little overview of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to do a, a, try to get a deep understanding of hazardous products um, in and outside of your home, so we're going to be going in and out. Proper use, storage, and disposal of those. Alternatives for some of those, and I stress the alternatives without compromising on productivity or without compromising on clean or what you want that product to do. 
And then our kumbaya moment, which is enlightenment and changes in our behavior. That's what we all want um, after we present the facts on there. So we as a, as a human species are um, a very convenient species. We like our products, and uh, we're admittedly a little gross, myself included. So we collect a lot of things, and we don't always um, dispose of them properly. Once they go away from us, we're just like, it's gone. I don't know where it went. It's, it's away from me. I don't really care what happens to it. However, that is to the detriment of our environment, and it can be to the detriment of us. So we're going to look at a few things that um, you're doing at home, again, inside and out, and try to uh, change some of those things, again, to change that behavior. When we're talking about hazardous waste, we have waste that has a characteristic to make it harmful to human health and the environment. And the words you'll see on a lot of products are toxic, corrosive, ignitable, and reactive. Now, sometimes there's a product that you need to do a certain function that you have to have it. But oftentimes, there's things that you have in your home or inside or out that you don't necessarily need. Examples of some of those hazardous waste, air fresheners, rat poison, drain cleaners, motor oil. Again, some of these you definitely need. Some of them, there are alternatives to them. When we have some of these, these products, the main issue is, is we don't necessarily know what's in them. We don't know what they're doing to us on a cumulative basis, and we don't know how to dispose of them. So the, the biggest advice I can give you is if you don't know how to dispose of a product, call your, your county solid waste district, not soil and water. Uh, everybody gets us confused, um, but contact your solid waste district. They are the experts on that. They're going to be able to tell you where to put that product or how to dispose of it properly. You can't quite see that on there. But there's different pathways. You can get chemicals within your body. Um, of course, you can inhale it when you're using that product. You can swallow it. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's accidental swallowing, because if you're purposely swallowing a product, and that's an issue I can't address in this presentation, um, you've got bigger issues, that's all I'm saying. Uh, absorption through your eyes and skin when you're using those products, not just when you're putting them on a surface to clean it, um, but also after, because those products tend to stay there for quite a long time, and you can have a continued, continued um, exposure to them over time. Contact from eating and drinking, again, not eating or drinking the product, but eating and drinking, meaning if you use them in the kitchen or on a table, and they can get onto your, your foods or plates, um, and again, a continued uh, exposure to those. Now we're going to hop outside here for a second. I'm going to go in and out like a cat that can't decide whether it wants to go in or out. We all know how that is. Um, but we're outside right now, and this is how your chemicals get into your environment. The three ways they get there, of course, by air, by water, and by soil. And soil being the most egregious of those because you have those chemicals that you're using outside that can adhere to soil particles, and they stay there for a long time, and they run off, and they get into your waterways exposing not only the soil, but the water, and in turn, the air itself. Sediment or soil is actually the number one pollutant in our waterway, which is kind of a surprise to a lot of people. Not that it's just it's soil in there, but it's also everything that's jammed into that soil and has held onto that as well when it gets into the water. We all are, part, all are part of a bigger picture, not only within our homes or our marinas or where we live or work or play, um, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, but when it comes to our water and what we do on our property, uh, we are part of a watershed. So this is the point where I usually ask people what a watershed is, but I feel like everybody in this room knows. Um, and I did have, I did bring a prize to give to somebody who got the right answer, but you guys aren't getting it because I know you already know the answer. So for those of you online who are not familiar with what the term watershed, it is not a shed that holds water. Um, that will get the prize thrown at your head. Um, but a watershed is an area of land that drains through a certain body of water. And then within the state of Ohio, we have two distinct watersheds. The top third of the state drains out to Lake Erie, out to the St. Lawrence Seaway, or Lake Ontario, correct? Erie, Ontario, St. Lawrence Seaway, and the Atlantic Ocean. Always mess that up a little. Thank you. And the bottom two thirds of the state goes out to the Ohio River, makes it to the Mississippi, out to the Gulf of Mexico. So people are like, great, that's fine. Um, you know, where I am right now goes to Lake Erie. So what we mainly do is try to get people to care about what water is in their backyard. And you as marina owners, obviously you're caring about what's going on on Lake Erie or wherever your marina is. The red line around there is uh, Cuyahoga County. And does anybody know what watershed we're in right now? People in the room, I'm going to make you answer. Oh, they don't know. Oh, you're all wrong. Porter, yes, Sarah got it right. Sarah, you can have a book up here if you want. 
So we are in the Porter Creek watershed. If you look over to the way left down there next to the, the red line, number 18 is the Porter Creek watershed. We're on the far west side of Cuyahoga County. Everything that we do outside of our home and some inside uh, is either a direct drain right out to Lake Erie or it goes into your storm drain or ditch system and it goes out into Lake Erie, which of course is a source of our drinking water, recreation. Um, you know, Lake Erie is our best natural resource that we have, so we really want to protect it. Um, there is an issue, I think, sometimes with Lake Erie with the Cuyahoga River that burns many times, and, you know, people say, why well, don't even go to the lake? It's dirty. And so there's not as much love for the lake as there really needs to be, I think, which is a shame because I think it's, it's, a, it's a, such a great resource and it's beautiful. So just getting people to care about the water that flows in their backyard, whether they're in the Big Creek watershed or Euclid Creek or Joan Brook, um, they can care about that. If you can get them to do that, you can in turn get them to care about the health of Lake Erie itself. And as Mel mentioned, the stormwater pollutants are non-point source pollutants. Um, those are things that don't come from one definable source. It's basically everything that we do in and out of our homes or outside of our homes, on our properties, our schools, churches, stores, what have you. And those are things we put on the land that when rain and snow melt over it, it goes into our waterways through a storm drain or ditch system out to our waterways completely untreated. So the biggest one is usually fertilizer and pesticide, but the one people don't think about as much is pet waste. So, and also oil and gas, sediment I mentioned before, and litter. Um, pet waste, any one of these is going to be not an issue if it's just done on a one-time thing. So if I'm walking my dog and I let it go to the bathroom and I don't pick it up because, let's face it, it's gross, um, that's not going to take down our waterways or cause E. coli, e. coli breakouts in Lake Erie. There are 90,000 registered dogs in Cuyahoga County. So that's a lot of dogs and that's a lot of what? Yeah, you know it. All right. Um, oil and gas, there's actually a study out in Puget Sound that the amount of oil that flows into Puget Sound, this is out west, that flows into Puget Sound every two years is equivalent to one Exxon Valdez oil spill. This is oil and gas from leaking cars. This is not oil and gas from any sort of um, you know, spill or anything. So what we're talking about here inside and out are those cumulative effects of pollutants and the cumulative effect on the environment and on our health as well. Uh, we refer to it as death by a thousand cuts. If I get one cut on my arm, I'm going to be fine. If I get a thousand cuts on my body, it means I'm opening myself up to infection, disease, and possible death. So one pet waste, one leaking car, blah, 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 is one cut. We're getting thousands upon thousands upon thousands of cuts into our environment every day. All right, so what are in these products that I mentioned before that's really causing you harm? And again, one, you know, you have, we all have to do our laundry. We all have to dust our house and not have to need to be disgusting. Uh, we all have to clean our windows even if we want to or not. But there are certain chemicals that are in there that have products that are certain chemicals in there that can have ill health effects. So you have laundry detergents that can cause hormone disruptors, furniture polish, neurotoxins, window cleaners, carcinogens, and so on. Um, so these products, there are alternatives you can use to them, and they still work just as good, um, but they're better for you, they're better for the environment. Now, all these years you've been dusting your, you know, furniture and everything, it doesn't mean you're going to get have a, a neurotoxicity issue, but it just means if we can take one element of that out of your environment, why wouldn't you? And why wouldn't you have it better for you, better for the environment, and again, not compromising on what you want that product to do. And I know this is for clean marinas, but a lot of this within your home, within your businesses, can relate right to a marina and what you do. And as Adam mentioned, and I think Mel did as well, if they see you doing those kind of things, those kind of practices, it's very attractive to somebody to come to you as a business um, to utilize you because you're making the right choices to do this and it's better for them, it's better for you as well. So precautions when you're using chemicals, some of these seems pretty obvious, but I say them because apparently they're not. Um, don't use, try not to use them when the children are present, keep your house well ventilated, protective clothing, purchasing only what you need. You don't need to go to Costco and get that giant thing of Windex at the size of your house. You don't need that. That's just a chemical you've got going on in your house. Try not to mix cleaners. Taking precautions in the kitchen. Again, you're near food. But I said that's a way you can get those chemicals within your body as they're exposed to your food. And storing them properly. You know, you don't use those products all the time, so you want to make sure that they're stored in a place that they're going to be safe. And just to expand on that a little bit, 
keep it in the original container. Um, I was raised by a chemical engineer who loved to make products and keep them in random containers in the basement. Nobody knew what they were. So when we uh, cleaned out my parents' house and I took those products to the Household Hazardous Waste Cleanup, I thought they were going to turn me away. And they took it on and they said, we've seen it all before. I'm like, all right, I have no idea what this stuff is. But uh, try not to keep stuff in the closet or garage, uh, not, or keep it in the closet or garage, not in a kitchen, not near a food source. Uh, again, pretty self-explanatory, but storing flammables away from a heat source, you think it's self-explanatory, but we've heard some stories. It's all I'm saying. Keeping it out of reach of young children. Yes, you can use safety locks. However, I think kids are crafty. They can figure that stuff out. What the advantage we have over them is height. If we can put it up high, they can't reach it unless they build some elaborate ladder system, but which could work. Um, with leftover chemicals, I've got something that I'm not sure that I really want it anymore. Well, if you decide you're going to use it up, you want to dispose of it properly, and again, that's where you call your solid waste district. There are millions of products out there. So I can't tell you each one of how to dispose of it. Um, when I do this in a longer presentation, I do have a bag of products that I give to the room, and I have them tell me how they would dispose of it, what they would do with it, what this product means to them. And it's quite confusing. Because you have windshield wiper fluid, and on the bottle, it says it has a recycle um, thing on the bottom. So that actually is a hazardous waste, and that bottle, when it's done, should go into the trash. But if it has a chemical still in it and you're trying to get rid of it, you take it to household hazardous waste, even though the bottle says to recycle it. So it can be quite confusing. If you don't want it anymore, share it with a neighbor. Again, bring it to household hazardous waste. Please do not dump it down the drain, inside or outside of your home. It's absolutely not what we want you to do. Even though that sink in your home will go to the sewer district or wherever you have a, or your facility for your waste, your sewage, it doesn't mean they can get all of those chemicals out of the water supply. Some does end up back into Lake Erie, and again, that's the source of our drinking water. So we do have some residual when it comes to um, chemicals that are dumped on the drain. Trying to use some safer cleaners in your home. Um, taking an inventory in your home is a really interesting exercise. Again, when we cleaned out my parents' house, we found nine bottles of calcium, lime, and rust. Anybody know what that is? Just that big bottle of calcium, lime, and rust. Why we had that many bottles, I have no idea. I think somebody had to use it upstairs one time, and they're like, well, we need some. And they put it upstairs, and then somebody used it in the basement. So taking an inventory and seeing what you have in your home is an interesting exercise. Identifying those risks and choosing alternatives, just taking a little time to see what you have in your home and what those products are. Take some research. Choosing the least harmful product, <coughs> choosing low or no VOC options, volatile organic compounds. A little story on that, I have a friend who had a baby a number, or his wife was having a baby a number of years ago, and he chose to paint the baby's room <clears throat> while his wife was in the hospital having a baby. So why is that an issue? You have a lot of off-gassing coming off of that paint in the room. You know, that, that good paint smell that everyone likes? I know, I like gas smell too, and skunk. But <laughs> whatever, I'm weird. And, uh, you know, I think I like it bad for me. But it's off-gassing, and that baby, a very vulnerable small baby with a developing system, is exposed to that off-gassing from those volatile organic chemicals from paint. So think about things that you're doing when you do that. And then reading the labels, of course, beware of greenwashing. Again, when I do this, this presentation at, at length, uh, we go through a bunch of products, and it's very confusing to find products that are quote-unquote good for you and good for the environment and not harmful with those chemicals in them. Greenwashing means that saying, this is a green product, it's organic, and like Mel was saying with the organic lawn care, there's not any, am I correct, there's no certification for that? It's the same thing with products as well. So you can slap a pretty leaf or a pretty flower on there, and you can say, that looks really nice, it's green, you know, they have that pretty color green on there. Be really careful of greenwashing it and do your homework. We did find a couple product certifications. Hang on one second. Needed a drink of water. Green Seal and Green Guard. The one I gravitate towards the most is the under the EPA. It's a safer choice uh, certification. It used to be the, called the US EPA Design for the Environment, which is the logo underneath. I don't know what year the top one came into play, so you may see one or the other. That's a product that you at least know has been certified by the EPA for a safer choice. If you have some products in your home, there are some alternatives you can use. 
Uh, if you have a, an oil-based paint, try to use a latex paint, and you're going to avoid um, a toxic ingredient like a solvent. Um, oh, this is disgusting, but has anybody, we have some women in the room, drain hair, can you just talk about it? It's the most disgusting thing you'll ever do in your life. Everyone's shaking their head, because look, he's even saying it. He knows. All right, you have to clean out your drain hair. It's a fact of life, and everybody has tried all the Drano's, all the products, right? Do any of them work? Never. They never work. You know what works? Is you get one of those plastic long things from Marks that have any discount store that has the little knobbies on it. You throw it down there, you pull it up, you get that nasty drain hair, you throw up, and you go on with your day. Am I right? It's the most disgusting, foul thing ever, however it works. All those caustic drain openers, they don't work, and they're really harmful to you and to your health, and probably to your pipes as well. All right, moving on. No mention beneficial nematodes if you have grubs in your yard. Um, then a weed puller, an herbicide, you're avo avoiding a lot of those chemicals that are on there. Some good natural products that you probably already have around your home, baking soda, borax, eucalyptus oil, hydrogen peroxide. Some of these are things, this is nothing new, you guys. These are things that your grandparents use, your great-grandparents use. Before we had every single product available to us telling us they could fix all of our issues. These are products that work really well. And if you use them properly, they can get done what you need to get done. Olive oil, toothpaste, um, different liquid soaps. And then the coup de gras, which is, is, of course, white distilled vinegar, which I think is the answer pretty much to anything. White distilled vinegar just works. It's what I use in my house. I use vinegar, water, and essential oils mixed together. And the essential oils are not just for pretty smells. They're also an antifungal, antibacterial, and anti something else I forget right now, property to them, um, so they also smell nice, but it cuts grease, cleans the wood, glass, removes tarnish, it's just a great product. Oh, I mentioned those words before, toxic, reactive, ignitable. These are some words you're going to look for if you're looking for a safer cleaner, biodegradable, non-toxic, plant-based ingredients, and of course, a water-based product. Now we're going to go outside, we're the cat that wants to go outside. So we have friendly lawn care, land, lawn care excuse me, and landscaping. We want all that to be environment, wallet, kid, pet, pollinator, all that to friendly to all of those. And of course we want our nice green lawn, if that's what we're going for, we want it to look pretty as well. Um, as Mel mentioned, and I'll just repeat this because it, it definitely deserves repeating, is everything we do on our lawn eventually makes its way out to Lake Erie. So it's going down that storm drain. Lake Erie, did, Lake Erie originally starts with the headwater streams and all the geeky people in this field understand that. Um, but Lake Erie actually starts in the urban cycle in your storm drain. So it starts at your house. Everything you're doing there is getting into the storm drain, going out to Lake Erie completely untreated. Everybody remembers this, the so algae bloom of 2011. Um, we had a bigger one a couple years ago. That's disgusting. So that should really affect you as a marina owner and as a boat owner and somebody who likes to go out on the lake um, who's trying to do a business when it comes to our lake. I believe this was taken a couple years ago when the uh, Toledo water system was actually shut down for a few days. I don't know who this is out there, but they're crazy. It's, it's, just, it's kind of pretty and gross at the same time. It's so nasty. I have closer up ones too, which I deleted. But uh, I actually came back from Florida. I was down there in July uh, near the St. Lucie River. You guys hear about the algae blooms down there? Uh, it's right along the St. Lucie and the Indian River where they open up to the Atlantic Ocean. And we couldn't go on the river. We couldn't go in the ocean, even though it dissipated. They told us not to. And all those marina owners down there were, it's their, they're small businesses. And they were like, this is, this is our livelihood. And for about a month or so, they had no business. And some of them were like, we may shut down. You know, so really, in every environmental issue has an economic component to it. There is no doubt about that. So, sir, my water fell. I got a little overzealous here, people, and I knocked my water over. All right, so this was supposed. This didn't work. I'm sorry. Uh, this was a little animation on what you're doing on your lawn. Uh, it's basically you're trying to break the cycle of a chemically infused lawn, and Mel had mentioned that before. It was pretty graphic, and it's just not working right now. But we're fertilizing our lawn, and we're asking it to grow, and then, oh my God, it, it grows, so we have to cut it. And then we are spraying anything that, that wants to grow there as well, because maybe we cut our lawn too short. And now dandelions, who love a short lawn, because the light exposure is there, 
the dandelions pop up, <clears throat> so we freak out and we spray those. Um, and then, of course, we want to kill any bug or invader that comes into our house because, God forbid, we have some sort of life that goes on in our lawn. That help us. Biggest thing you can do when it comes to your lawn, before you go crazy on it or, or your marina or wherever you are, um, is to find out the story of your lawn. And I think you guys will both agree with me, especially Mel, who works in this field. Find out the story of your lawn. What is going on? Getting your soil tested. Um, most soil tests will test for um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. There is a test that uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst will test for organic matter and lead in your soil, which can be an issue here in the Cleveland area. Finding out what you need or what you don't need. You know, fertilizer companies uh, spend millions of dollars on advertising telling you what you need and when you need it. Why waste your money, waste your time, putting yourself at unnecessary risk to chemicals if you don't need to. Reconsidering your definition of a weed, uh, dandelions were actually brought in uh, when people settled into America. They were brought in for salads, medicinal use, for wines, of course, and they planted gardens of dandelions to remind them of home. And then through the, the you know, passage of time and when people decided that a green monoculture of just uh, green lawn was what they wanted, uh, dandelions fell out of favor and now it's like a holy war on dandelions, right? Dandelions are the very first thing that bees forage on when they break cluster and they get out of their hive in the, uh, in the early spring, including uh, clovers. And if you haven't eaten anything besides your honey stores for the winter and you just want to get out of your home and the first thing you eat after the winter is poison, you're going to be pretty mad. And what we ask from bees to do for us, they provide billions of dollars of products for us each year and we're poisoning them. So let's just take it easy on the dandelions. Lawns, again, don't need to be a monoculture. We want diversity in our life. We want diversity in our lawns as well. There's so many parallels between nature and how we lead our lives. Um, reading your weeds, and I have quite a few handouts here that I'll have Sarah either post online or uh, anyone can email me for them. There's a great uh, uh, fact sheet from the National Coalition for Pesticide-Free Lawns. If I have crabgrass, if I have clover or what have you, here's what's actually happening in my lawn. Don't just try to make up like you know what it is, because chances are you don't. So here's a little chart here and what is actually happening in your lawn and what you should do for it. There's some great Beyond Pesticide fact sheets that have really strong cases of why you should reduce or get rid of some of those chemicals on your lawn. Uh, there's health effects. There's uh, lawn care without chem chemicals. Five reasons not to use weed and feed. The chemicals in weed and feed are actually half of the chemicals that were in Agent Orange that they used in Vietnam. So we're thinking about that. Um, another fact sheet on children and pesticides don't mix. When we have children and we have animals outside, their environment is the ground. So they're down there, they're putting their hands in it, their feet, it's on their clothes. Of course, they're putting things in their mouth. They have developing neurological systems, circulatory systems, everything. And then we're putting chemicals in that, and so we're really putting them at risk, including ourselves. But they're the more vulnerable, and they're the ones crawling right in it. So let's think about that before we just start putting stuff on our lawn without thinking about it. And then the last part right here, um, you're probably wondering why I have Elsa there, and I'm not going to sing. <coughs> but a lot of people at the end of the season, uh, they tear out everything out of their lawn, which is probably the worst thing you can do for your garden, because you're depriving the soil of all those good microbes that are in there. Um, and you're also depriving any wildlife that uses that winter habitat for food, shelter, uh, they build nests with it, what have you. I know you guys don't like deers, but calm down, they gotta eat too, you know? But keeping that stuff there, it also gives you some winter interest in your marina, in your home, whatever. So like Elsa, we're asking you to just let it go, right? Um, keeping that stuff there, and then in the spring you can neaten it up and plant again. But if you're pulling out all of their, your um, foliage in the end of the fall, uh, again, you're pulling up a food source that's in your soil that desperately needs it over the winter for that long time when it's not getting it. Uh, two most popular recipes, again, one inside, one outside. The all-purpose cleaner I mentioned before, that's what I use almost all over my house. Um, it's just vinegar, um, eight ounces of water, and an essential oil. When you're buying essential oils, you want to buy the good stuff. You want to buy the stuff that's concentrated, that's meant to dissipate into a liquid. And uh, it's not the stuff that's going, you're going to put on your skin to smell pretty. Um, it's just very, very concentrated, so you want to get the good stuff. We get our the Whole Foods, there's somewhere else I can't remember, Earth Fair in Rocky River. 
Um, and if you have any questions about that, you can always email me at it. The weed killer, <clears throat> some people go crazy with Roundup. First of all, reframing how you think of your lawn and what a weed really is and what it means to you. I know it's just a plant in a wrong place, um, is how I define it, which is why I consider a rose a weed, because I hate them and they have thorns on them. And I said that to a garden club one time and I thought they were going to slash my tires. But anyway, I don't like them. So I don't think dandelions are weeds, but I think roses are. So it's just what you define it as. However, I like dandelions in my lawn, but not in my garden, because they kind of take over and just they get all prickly and everything. So I do pour some vinegar on them. Uh, the dishwashing liquid will help the uh, vinegar kind of adhere to the plant itself, and then the water just you know helps it kind of mix around in there. Uh, sometimes people say, well, this doesn't work and it doesn't work fast enough and I have to reapply it and it has to be on a hot day. So I've even gone as far as just pouring straight vinegar on the leaves where I don't want them and then they're gone within a day. If it's a warm day, the sun's out, it's going to bake that, it's gone. So, And I do have a whole other list of recipes. There's tons of stuff online too, but if you want the recipes, I can give those to you as well as to post. Uh, and that's it for me. Great. Thanks. have one more reminder in case anybody has questions uh, to please post them in the chat box. Um, Christina, I'll check back with you to see if you've seen anything. Uh, we'll allow a few minutes and then I'm going to go ahead and not to be able to type it, but on the, uh, on the screen you should have a slide right here that shows you a post-webinar survey. If you have a few minutes, um, It'd be, we'd greatly appreciate it. It would give us feedback on the webinar and also input for future webinars. Um, part of what we hope to do through the Great Lakes Clean Marina Network and our Clean Marina programs is to continue to provide you with educational information uh, that's related to environmental topics for your marina. Um, so feel free to take that survey. It's go.osu.edu backslash going green marina survey and uh, that will give us some input for the future. You're welcome to contact us. Um, I'll uh, make sure to have my information available. Uh, you can also contact us on, through the Great Lakes Clean Marina Network at any time. And uh, with that, I'll check with you, Christina, but I think we're all set. We are. All right. I don't see any uh, questions in the chat box, so we will go ahead and close the webinar. Thank you all very much for participating.